Someone once asked a very famous theologian, Sir, don't you think God has revealed Himself in other religions and not only in Christianity? No, the man answered. God has not revealed Himself in other religions, including Christianity. He has revealed Himself in the Son. In Jesus Christ, God has spoken for Himself, and we must hear that speech. Oh, listen to Jesus the Christ. We're about to read this morning. Are Jesus' words and our eternal destiny depends on our response to what you're hearing and the quality and significance of your life hinges on what he says in these words. Open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 14. We'll start at the very beginning of that chapter. Jesus has been talking to his men that last night when he was betrayed, the last Passover he had, and he began the Lord's Supper. And after he washed their feet and passed the supper and, the Pentec- and, and Passover, He taught them many things, his final words, his goodbyes, like, how to be ready for my departure. And as he told them they were leaving, they didn't ask, well, where are you going until now? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come and take you to be with me, to be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. And good old Thomas, you know, the doubting Thomas who wanted to stick his hand in Jesus' side or didn't believe. Good old Thomas, we know where he stands all the time. He doesn't go with those fancy theological words. He simply says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? Duh. (laughs) And Jesus kindly, diplomatically, and yet these next words that he says are so hard to understand that if you go out in the public square, if you stand on the corner, if you go into the schools, you go into universities, and you read this and firmly believe it, it might be called hate speech. Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus answered, Thomas, how do we know where you're going? He said, if you really knew me, verse 7, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Then Philip speaks up, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. We just want to see his, his glory. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? And Jesus answered him politely. Clearly, accurately, don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me, Philip? After I've been with you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, who could say that and not be considered a lunatic or a liar unless he's the Lord? If you've seen me, you've seen God. Try that in a crowd and see what they say to you. Okay. So how can you say, show us the Father, Philip? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, living in me, who is doing his work? Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I raised the dead, I walked on water, fed the thousands. Look at that evidence. I healed the blind. You were with me all the time. This wasn't a magic act. I caused the lame to walk. The dumb to speak. I cast out demons. Believe the miracles. Here's my credentials. I tell you the truth, verse 12. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. And he will do even greater things than these. Did you you hear what he just said? He's talking to you who believe in Jesus. 
you will be do, do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son of Man may be glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And he goes on with some very powerful conversations after that. We want to stop and just look at those right now. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. You will do greater things than Jesus? Well, Jesus gives us two reasons in this passage that you will. Write this down in your message notes and online as well. Jesus, the Christ, is the only way to God. That's the first reason that you are being enabled to do greater things than what Jesus did on this earth. He is the only way to God. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? And, and, Phil, and Thomas says, okay, time out. Just tell us the destination. I'll get my Google out here and Google Maps, and we'll know how to get there, right? Heaven. Oh, there's no map for heaven, is there? I don't know. How do we do that? Jesus answered to Thomas, it's not about maps or travel plans. Jesus is talking about what life is really all about. There is the way to go. From Psalm 1. The righteous man chooses the right way. In fact, the early church in the book of Acts was known, here's the name of the church, the way. Not a way, not another way, not a better way, but the way is what they were known as, and they were considered a sect of Judaism. The way. It's all about him. Where am I going? You don't know? I'm going back to the Father. I have told you that many times. I'm going to the Father. I just said it earlier. In verse 6, we read, Jesus said, I am the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. This is the most exclusive statement made by anyone on this planet. It's, it's intolerant. It needs to be canceled. There are other ways to heaven, right? Billions of people believe so. And here's this man saying, I am the only way to heaven, to God. That's what he just said. So how else would you interpret this verse? Some people say the Bible isn't true. That's how they interpret it. It's just a story. But we believe the Bible is literally the inspired Word of God and the words you have on this page are the exact words that God intended to be inscripturated, written down, that we have. That's the authority of Scripture. How else would you interpret this passage? You talk to your friends who are in other religions or philosophies, and you stand up and say, you know, I believe that Jesus is the only way to get to God. Well, that's your truth. No, it is the truth. <laughs> It is the way and it is the life. It's not another truth in this world where everything seems relative and there's no moral bearing, you've lost your compass, whatever. How do we know what's really true? Jesus is standing in front of you and saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's the only way to the Father. So could you interpret this as saying, well, some come to the Father by me and some come to the Father by sincerely trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Uh, some try to come to the Father by faithfully partaking in the ordinances. Or some say they can come to the Father by Muhammad or Buddha with bliss or Confucius. This is not hate speech. This is a man who speaks with an authority that's above all these other people and religions. That is the core of the Christian faith. Who is Jesus? And why did he come? And what did he say? What difference does it make? Not Scientology, my good works, not ignorance. There's no other way, Jesus says, to the Father's house but through me. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. So let's just stop for a moment and think about that. How many of you had a conversation with people to say Jesus isn't God? And I'm thinking, have you ever read what the Bible says in the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John, who was right there with Jesus, and I witnessed these things are written that you may believe that Jesus 
That's who he says he is. And, and then I'm going to give you eight miracles, for example, for you to consider to find out. Jesus said he was God. The people who heard him considered him that that's what he said. They were going to stone him to death because of it. In fact, the reason he was crucified is because he blasphemed, claiming to be God. He claimed to be that. So here we stand alone. And if anyone hear me say this, outside of Christian circles, you would be enraged. You would call me intolerant. I did not make this up. I did not write the Bible. But I believe the Bible is true. And I believe that Jesus is the way to God. The only way. And that is a missionary motive. There's no other way on this planet for anyone to get to heaven but through Jesus Christ. None. That's what he just said. And if what Jesus says is not really true, then he is the most intolerant, narcissistic, arrogant, delusional person who ever lived. He's not a good person if this isn't true. This is an audacious statement because it is true. It is reality. It is the stake in the ground in which you base absolute truth. And when you pull the anchor from that absolute truth, you drift. And the waves deceive you. And you say, well, Mike, you're being a little bit... Into no, look at the Bible. What does Jesus just say? I'm encouraging you to read the Scriptures firsthand for yourself. Read the Gospel of John for yourself, any version you want. And listen to what He says about Himself. That's who He calls you to believe in. This Jesus. Settle it today. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? And when you understand that, then you understand. Where is the road to heaven? You see in your message notes, where's the road to heaven? I am. Write that down. That's the road to heaven. I am. A missionary hired a guide there in Africa to lead them across the Sahara Desert. This is before they had Google Maps and all that kind of stuff. And so the, the missionary arrived at the edge of the desert with this guide, and looking ahead, all he could see was this trackless, vast, hot, sandy dunes all over the place, no landmarks whatsoever. And turning to the guide, he says, well, where's the road? And the guide said, I am the road. I know how to get there. And Jesus knows how to get there because he's, he's come from there and now he's going back to there. I am the preexistent God who in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God who created the universe. That's who he is, John 1.1. 1, 1. I know the road to heaven because I came down that road to get here and I'm going back. Jesus is our only road. He is the I am. He alone is the path of God. Follow him. And those who heard Jesus and believed him understood it and risked their lives and their livelihood and, and the threat of everything. For in Acts 4.12, they said, salvation is found in Buddhism. Salvation is found in your feelings and your thoughts. Salvation is found in self-improvement. Salvation is found in Judaism. What did these men say? Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no under name under heaven given to people whereby we must be saved. There is no other name. And we're going to talk about that name all the time. And they were persecuted for that. They were martyred for that. And that's what he calls us to stand up and say, there is no other name under heaven where anybody can get to heaven except Jesus the Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And why not? Who of us can save ourselves and get ourselves to heaven? Who could, it says in Psalm 49, who could pay the price of redemption to buy ourselves into heaven or pay the price for another? You can't be baptized for somebody else to get into heaven. There's a price that only one person can pay, and that's Jesus Christ. There were two people hiking in the wilderness. They didn't know where they were going. They were lost in the woods. And so they're just looking up in the sky and the stars, and all of a sudden they fall down this shaft. <laughs> 
like, like a well into a mud pit where they couldn't even get traction, the water up to here, and they're stuck. And so the woman turns to the man, get me out of this mess. It's icky down here. So the man says, I'm right here. What can I do? I can't climb those walls. I'm stuck. What are you going to do to help me get out there? Well, I can't do anything either. And unless somebody comes, we're going to die here. Nobody knows we're here. So they wait. They sink in the darkness, in despair. Who's going to lift them out of that deep pit? It's got to be somebody who's never fallen into that pit. And they hear a voice, search and rescue. Anybody down there? No, hardly any voice. They're almost dead. Wait a second. I'm just not going to throw you a rope and you grab on and I'll pull you up. And if you keep holding on, you get up. No, I'm going I'm to come down that pit and tie you around myself and pull yourself up. You see, it takes someone from above who's never fallen through that pit. And here we are as human beings. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us live with that selfish component in our lives where evil comes from right across our hearts. None of us can save ourselves because we all are sinners, and the soul that sins shall die. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Oh, we may be walking around in the body, but we're like zombies. There's no spirit. We have a soul. We have emotions. We have a physical life, but that spirit has been snuffed out by sin in our lives, and it can only be reignited by the Holy Spirit coming inside and baptizing us and bringing us to life by the Holy Spirit, redemption. And Jesus is the one who came as search and rescue. He's the only one who could because he never sinned, the Bible tells us. We believe it all of his life. He came to do the will of the Father, and he says, I've always do what the Father tells me to do. Only he could come down and rescue people stuck in the pit because he's, never, he's not in the pit either. He is God. He is the road. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, and it's not the Pope, and it's not the priest, and it's certainly not the pastor. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, and it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it is the man, Christ Jesus. Your destiny depends on whether you believe what Jesus said about himself. I am the way. And how does the way bring us to God? Some of you, especially women's ministries, have been studying like the book of Hebrews. Good for you. That's a tough book, but you know what it's all about? It's saying to the Jewish community that Jesus is better than angels and everything else. He is superior, and he is our great high priest. And as, a, as the high priest in Jerusalem and Israel would go behind that temple, that curtain that separated the Holy of Holies on the Yom Kippur and made sacrifice for the people, Jesus, our great air price, has gone. Our anchor holds within the veil, the song says. He is our great high priest, and he represents us to God and God to us. He makes atonement after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 6, entered the Holy of Holies for our own behalf, and, he, and a new and living way, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. He is completely effective, and only once was his death. That was enough. No more sacrifices needed. His death covers it all. Hebrews 9, 12 to 16 makes the law obsolete. His priesthood is not given to any other. It is non-transferable. He is the only one who could be the one who is between God and man, Jesus the Christ. The way brings you to God because he is our great high priest. No one else can, and he has done it. And because Jesus is the way, follow him. Not a caricature of Jesus. Most people reject the caricature of Jesus. You know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and Sunday school stories about carrying the lamb, this white Anglo guy with blonde hair like that. That's not Jesus. When John saw Jesus in the Revelation, he saw him flaming eyes, you know, and why? This, is, this man has come, and he is the man of God. And he says about himself, not only am I the way, I am the truth. Write that down. What is the truth? I am. Jesus did not say, I will teach you the truth, but I am the truth. Truth is a person and not a proposition. 
not a principle. Jesus is completely reliable. This is reality. This is where reality comes from. You start here and you build reality based on this truth fact that God loves you and has come for you. If what he said is not true about being the truth, then he's the worst bigot who ever lived who doesn't want to learn anything. I know it all. You can't teach me. No. What he said is true because he is truth. He is either the cornerstone or the stumbling block. He's either a sham or he is the Savior. If only for this life we believe in him and he's a sham, then we of all people are most miserable. Either Jesus is just optional or he is completely, absolutely essential for each one of us to believe in. Either being a Christian is being marginalized by this world or being in the mainstream of what reality really is all about. So why could Jesus say this and not be delusional and not be a deceiver? Because he's the only one on this planet ever to die and come back to life never to die again and ascended into heaven. Only person ever. So if I want to know somebody how to get to heaven, I think I want to know who he is because he's there now. No other prophet, no other religious leader, no matter how sincere or great their visions are, has ever died and risen from the dead never to die again. And that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 48. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. We're all just faking it. More than that, we were found to be false witnesses about God. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than any other people. Folks, if Christ is not risen, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and we die, we're dust. Let's just live life. That's a humanistic, existential life. And that's what most people are pursuing. This is all there is, so I'm going to get all I can go, get what I can now. But Jesus rose from the dead, and he really shows us who is the real God. In Hebrews 1.3, the Bible says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Just You look at the sun and you see there's the sun, but it blinds you. But that's, the, that's Jesus we're looking at, the radiance, the brilliance of God's glory. And then it goes on to say the exact representation of his being. Now, I have a ring on, and I've had some hot wax, and I was going to seal an envelope. I'd take that wax and put it on the envelope and take my ring and press it there, and there would be the impression, the exact impression of my ring. Jesus is the exact impression of God in the flesh. He is truth. He has come to tell us the truth because that deceiver, that liar, that father of lies is the author of confusion. If people are confused, where did that come from? Not the truth, but the author of confusion. He is the reality behind all reality, our Jesus and he's spoken clearly, and he did not stutter when he spoke the word of God. He clearly spoke it. This is Jesus revealing himself in the flesh, the truth. To know who God is, he just says it here, look, look at Jesus. You look at him, and you see eyes that are loving and kind. You see eyes that are forgiving. You see eyes that are caring. Where's the one who accuses you? I don't condemn you, and I don't condone what you're doing, but go and leave your life of sin. I forgive you. That's God speaking. The father of the prodigal son is a representation of God. That's Jesus saying this is what he does. He welcomes back the prodigal. He, he speaks to the, to the prig, the, the older brother, who is so self-righteous it stinks. And Jesus confronted them as well. Jesus is not just some spiritual guru who had a great intellect and great wisdom and had amazing visions. No, he stands alone, apart from all other religious leaders, everyone, because he alone is the one who rose from the dead, never to die again. My friends, this is compelling. This is life-changing. If you understand who Jesus really is, he has overcome and he says, good news, I've overcome the world. Believe in me. This is how you live. 
No human wisdom can understand the depths of Jesus' wisdom. We read in the Bible in Colossians 2, 3, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to know what truth really is? You know what wisdom really is? Or you love a philosopher? Or you love wisdom? Then look at the one who's the source of wisdom. That's Jesus Christ. Oh, fall on your knees and worship him. And Colossians goes on to say, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. My friends, it's good to know philosophy, to know what people think, but it, the purpose is not to diagnose man's problems. The purpose is to change our problems, and people can diagnose all they want, but how's that ever going to work without the power of God working inside of us? Don't be deceived by deceptive philosophy and wokeism or whatever else you want to call it about, which depends on human traditions and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. That is the message of God's holy word. And it separates this church from so many others in America. Oh, we don't want to offend anybody. No, I don't want to offend anybody either. But I want to preach the word. And if there's only one way out of a burning house, we better be sure we tell them the way out of the burning house. There's no other way out. How intolerant of a firefighter. Get out that way or you're going to die. Well, that's so intolerant. <laughs> Your life depends upon it. Governor Pilate, there in Jerusalem, judging this Jesus of Nazareth, are you so dulled by political power and fear and pressure and controlled by your own thoughts that you look straight in the eyes of the truth and you ask him, what is truth? Did you not hear what the truth just said to you? You are right in saying I am a king. For this, in fact, for this reason I was born to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That's after he's been severely flogged and awaiting the, the cross. Listen to this Jewish guy is about dead. Who says that? And how can this be true? What is truth? You're looking at him, Pilate. His face was so disfigured we did not recognize it. Isaiah 52. He had no beauty to attract us to him. Like a lamp led to the slaughter. This is our Jesus who came and died for us and rose from the dead that gave God's imprint of approval upon what Jesus said and did all of his life. He is the truth. Trust him alone. If you want to know what the world's all about, read your Bibles. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Here it is. Don't be biblically illiterate. Read it for yourselves. And because Jesus is the truth, you can trust him. So what is life? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he answers, I am. <laughs> I am the life. You've heard people say this about loved ones. They are my life. I love them. I go to work in the morning and I think about her and I can't wait to get home because she is my life or he is my life, everything about him. He's the reason I go to work and come home. I enjoy them so much. How much more Jesus is our life? I think about him all the time. My thoughts keep wandering back to who he is and how wonderful he is. He is the Son of God who came and rescued me from the pit. Did I deserve to get out of there? No, I'm in there for my own causes. But he in his grace has saved us. When Jesus says he's the life, he's stressing the fact that more, it's more important this physical life matters. It is a life worth living. It is the life that Jesus brings and gives. He is life himself. And this is the life, not a religion, but a relationship, a personal, vital, growing, dependent relationship on Jesus, the Son of God. He said, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never, ever thirst. And then he said to Mary and Martha and to the others, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the source of life. He is the source of energy. He is the source of health. You want to read a further 
dialogue that Jesus had discussing life with people. Open your Bibles and look at John chapter 5, verses 16 to 30. In verse 21 it says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son of Man gives life to whom it pleases Him. You're giving eternal life? Only God does that. But Jesus says, no, I do it too. You keep reading, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word, in verse 24, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. There's a promise that this Savior makes that is, take it to the bank. This is coin for eternity. Verse 25 of John 5, I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. No longer a zombie. Not just a body and a soul and a mix of emotions or can't figure out who I am. Now you're having real life. And then Jesus says this, in verse 26 of John 5, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. That is, God is self-existent, self-sufficient. And Jesus is self-existent, self-sufficient. God the Father, God the Son, Give life in themselves. They have it. They're the source of life. That's what he believed about himself. And he says just later down in verse 19 of John 14, because I live, you also will live. Are you crazy? This Jewish prophet 2,000 years ago promises me life. How can that be? Well, how many of you can stand up right now and say, I know I'm going to heaven? How many of you can stand up right now and say, I know my life has changed dramatically when he came into my life and changed me? How many of you? Thousands of people, over thousands of years, millions of people have found that the life of Jesus is the true life. Peter first said it, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God, so worship him. Absolutely, for all people, all cultures, throughout all centuries, at all times, every time, Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus Christ is the absolute truth about who the Creator is, who God is. Jesus is the absolute source of life. Because of Jesus' resurrection, He even said that He's the truth and the life. What He said is absolutely true. That's where you build your philosophy of life. That's where it all starts. That's the cornerstone, right? This is the center of the gospel. Not something that's true for you, and that's true for you, and not true for you. No, this is the undeniable impact, the absolute truth that God loves us, and God sent His one and only Son to us, that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life and never, ever perish. Oh, place your faith in Jesus right now. Stop where you are and pray, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, and I accept you into my life. I grab hold of you because Jesus' is life, worship Him. Now, Jesus, as I said, gives us two reasons why we will do greater things for Him. And we've talked about them. The first reason that Jesus is the Christ is the only way, he's the only way to God. That's the first reason. And when you are connected to the way, now you are connected to the source of the vine and the branch. And, the, and then the second reason is this. Look at this in verses 7 through 11. Write this down in your message notes. Jesus Christ is the physical presence of God. Verses 7 through 11. And he says, if you really knew me, and in the Greek it means if you really knew me, King James, Greek, NIV, whatever you say, this knowledge that really grasp it. If you knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, for you have really seen him in me. No wonder. Is it any wonder? That here we are, 2023, 2,000 years later, with this book in our hands, talking about the one person who really matters. The physical presence of God. He came, he, God, Emmanuel, we sing it at Christmas, God with us. 
That's what it means. If he really knew. The word know is used 141 times in John's gospel. He'd like to talk about that a lot. But, it, uh, but there's different means and shades of the word to know. And I see four different levels. Look at this. How well do you know Jesus? First of all, do you know Jesus as a historical fact? Would you push that on the uh, screen, please? How well do you know Jesus? There you go. Do you know Jesus as a historical fact? That's the lowest level. Yeah, I believe there was a Jesus. He lived 2,000 years ago. It's like, yes, I know there is a president. The second level of knowing is, do you know Jesus as the Savior? Yes, I know Jesus came to save the world. And um, that's like, I know the President of the United States deserves respect, so I respect that. that's what he said he did. However, you can know the fact and not know the truth behind this fact, and you're still lost in your sins. Here's the, deep, the third level that goes down. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? The third level introduces a personal relationship with him. That you're related to him. Yes, I've met the President of the United States several times. In fact, he calls me up and asks me advice about how the church in America is going. You believe that? No. <laughs> but if I did know the President that way, that's what we're talking That's the level. He knows me, I know him, we have a conversation together. But that's still not the deepest level of knowing what we're talking about here. The fourth level is do you know Jesus as your best friend? Yeah, I know the President. We talk with each other, but I'll tell you who really I know best of all, and he knows me best of all, and that's my wife. We talk, we love each other, and Jesus says, no longer do I call you slaves, I call you friends, because I tell you all that the Father has told me. There is an intimacy. Look into me and see my life. Touch my heart. And Jesus says, look into me and see intimacy, a relationship of friendship, of abiding in Jesus Christ. That's what he calls all Christians to, that level. Not just I know him as my Savior, but now I'm following him as my friend. And I'm laying down my life for my friend. And I know who he is because I'm reading his words to me, his love letter to me. Verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And he answered, you, don't you know me? If you've known me, you've, you've seen him. The word see, to see God, to the ancient world, this is the most staggering thing that Jesus ever said, that somebody could actually see God without being delusional. The Jews would, would count this as an article of faith that no one has seen God at any time and lived. Maybe Moses, but not many people see God. And he says, you've seen him. Here I am. I am tangible, visible presence of Jesus. So this word see means to see with understanding. When you look and you finally, you know those pictures of fine Waldo or something like that, and you finally find it, you say, uh-huh, I get it. That's when you finally understand who Jesus really is. Oh, no. He's not just a savior of my life. He's my best friend, and I want to follow him all the days of my life. I see I get it. He gets me. In fact, when Jesus said this, he addressed Philip in the singular. Philip, don't you see God? Look at me. Every individual in this room, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Everybody online, look to Jesus in his word. He speaks to us. The mirror of the Bible speaks to us and tells us who he is. I am in the Father and the Father's in me. So you wonder what that means. You've ever made tea before? You boil hot water. You take a bag of tea. You put the bag in the water, and the water gets in the tea. One and one, right? They're fused together. Now you have tea. And it's a miraculous way I don't understand it, that God is in, the fa is, is in Jesus, and Jesus is, in the, is in, in the Father. One, fused, infused with one another, so that I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what I see my Father do, he says in John 5. I always do what my Father says. That connection. Now, he didn't use his 
attributes to bring advantage to himself. He relied just on what we have, his word and the Holy Spirit. And he says, my friends, this is, you will now have all that you need for life and godliness. Look at my miracles if you don't believe. Verse 11, we've talked about that. Jesus said in John 10, 37 and 38, do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Who could walk on water? Only Jesus. You saw it with your own eyes. Who could feed 5,000 men at one time and then months later 4,000 another time with just small elements of fish and bread? So Jesus says we can take him at his word. What does he say here? You can review the miracles on your own. Look at um, Strobel's works. Great stuff on actually doing this. It would help you, guide you to do that. Believe the personal work of Christ to see the Father. Isn't that enough, Philip? Isn't that enough, everybody? Here it is. What do you need, some kind of special vision? Here it is. Jesus claims he provides all we need to live. So let's apply these verses more pointedly right now. Understand and apply these two facts. The fact, number one, Jesus is the only way to God, and Jesus is the physical presence of God. So what? What difference will that make to you today as you leave this room and you start to live your next day and next day and next day? Write this down. Jesus the Christ is the power of God in us. He imparts his righteousness to us. He gives us his Holy Spirit inside of us who guides us into all truth as we study the rest of, of this upper room. You will see all these things about the Holy Spirit's ministry and about the Word. It's all there. In fact, as I read verse 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will be doing what I've been doing. He'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. First off, you read this, is Jesus kidding? I'll do greater things than Jesus? I mean, I'm not going to just walk on water. I'm going to kind of hover over it, you know, like a Jedi Knight or something. I don't know. No, that's not what he meant. We cannot outdo Jesus' quality of his miracles at all, but the quantity is the greater things. You look what happened when the Spirit of God came. When Peter preached on Pentecost, that one sermon, 3,000 sinners came to faith in Christ. And you see in the book of Acts, it goes on and on and on. 2,000 years later, here you are. The scope and the quantity of Jesus' work is impactful. It's like a meteor has come and, and smashed upon the earth, and you see just the radiation of it going all over the globe, the gospel all over the globe. For, for, each, for centuries and centuries, he's come as that great meteor out of the sky, boom, and it changes all of our world. And he's still changing us. That's as he changes us as we share the faith, greater things. Jesus deputized his followers. It's our mission statement. Love God, love people, following Jesus, make disciples. Let's do it. We can. That's the good news. You know, in that 33 years Jesus lived on the earth, he did those miracles. We can't even count them. John said you couldn't even write enough books about it. And, of course, we cannot duplicate the miracle of his death, burial, and resurrection for us. No, he is majestic in all he's done. And now he deputizes you in the pew, online, to walk the way, to speak the truth, and to live the life of Jesus and bring glory to the Father. Your works is that which brings glory to the Father. As he said, why can we do this? Well, in Acts 1.8, he said, and you shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all throughout the parts of the earth. You, my friend, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you know what he does? He comes into your life. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, and he's knocking on your doors. We've talked about in Revelation. I'm knocking on the door. Do the first things first. Do the important things first. Don't you understand who's at the door and knocking on your heart? It's I, the overcomer. I want to give you an overcoming life. Let's do this. How can we do that? Jesus says, yes, the Spirit, and we'll talk about that more next week. But right now in verse 13, how do we do this? Through prayer. Look at verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. 
That's called prayer. So that the Son of Man may be in glory to the Father. I'm going to paraphrase it. You can count on me from now on. Whatever you uh, request along the lines of who I am and what I'm doing, I'll do it for you. You need a new pastor? Let's pray. You want to reach this community? Let's pray. You have a heart for the gospel? Pray. There is a supernatural power here that he gives to us. He will answer prayer. That's how the Father will be seen. And all that. And his Son is what we're doing here as we trust him, that we follow him in his steps. You know, we have drifted. I'm talking about we, I'm talking about the, the American church. And traditionally, churches drifted and they get into institutionalization. They get into taking care of themselves, into endowments, and who's the greatest, and who's going to be the leader of that organization or that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about seeing people place their faith in Jesus and grow as you disciple them, as you come alongside them and love them and let them into your lives and into your homes with hospitality and care. That's what we're talking about. You change your schedules, your times, your relationships. You allow other people into your busy lives by saying no to other stuff you don't really need to do. He'll show you. Greater works by prayer. You know, prayer is not like stroking some magic Aladdin's lamp kind of thing. I'll give you three wishes. The first wish is I wish this thing would never happen. <laughs> the first wish is I wish everybody on this planet would know Jesus as Savior. That's my first wish. The second wish, I hope you give me the resources to do it. And I hope you bring along people who have the same vision and purpose for downtown Hillsborough and Washington County. Not a program, not a ministry, but the body of believers loving other people by prayer, in my name. That's like the power of attorney. When we go out of the country, we make sure we have power of attorney so people can do business in my name. And I come back, I want to make sure that I have still resources in the bank, right? So I'm sure that the, I trust the person that they're, not, they're going to be good stewards of the resources I give to them, and that's what Jesus is talking about. In my name. This is not for us to spend it on our own pleasures, James chapter 4 but it's to accomplish the greater work, which is to bring glory to the Father through Jesus Christ. He said, I will do it. Not, okay, you pray and then you do it. No, he says, I will do it. Philippians 2.12, work, God, it works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. So work out what he's worked into you and he will do it. He is faithful. So Paul could write from a prison cell when he was captured, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things I ask him to do that he asked me to do. Jesus said it in John 15, 5. Keep on reading, John, after I'm gone. He says, if a person remains in me and I remain in them, same idea, the Father abiding in the Son, Son abiding in the Father, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do zip, nothing. Or you can have programs, you can build buildings, you can do this and that, but in terms of what really counts on this planet, abiding in Jesus, and Jesus abiding in you, your heart is finally set on the course of bringing glory to him through the Father, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He said in verse 14, you may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. Anything? Lord, did we hear David Rivas talk about what we need to pray for? Why do we want a pastor so we'll be a good, happy family or to reach the community? What is the purpose of this church? What is our vision? What is it all about? Show me the new believers and show me the old believers discipling the new believers. That's what it's all about as I read the Scriptures. Listen to the Christ. He promises you that you will do greater things. In the Old Testament, there's a scripture in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Let's put that up on the screen, please. King Asa had trusted in God when other armies came in to destroy them, but now this third army comes from the northern kingdom and he's afraid. And so he hires mercenaries to support him. And the prophet Hanani comes to him and says, Listen, God, the Lord is looking. 
into your hearts to see if you're fully committed to Him. Because when you're fully committed to me, I will give you the strength to do what I've called you to do. Don't trust in mercenaries. Don't trust in the next thing or the next thing. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen to the Christ. Oh, our Heavenly Father is looking for men and women whose hearts are always set on Him, who are in love with Him, who alone will trust Him and trust Him alone to do the work He desires. Someone wrote, The world is waiting to see what God can do through a consecrated soul. Yeah? As your intentional interim pastor, we must step away from this church to care for our health needs. I'd like to paraphrase that statement. The world is waiting to see what God can do through a consecrated soul. Here's what I would say. Make sure this comes up on the screen when I say it. Hillsborough is waiting to see what God can do through a consecrated church that is fully committed to do the greater things Jesus promised you. What has He promised you? Lay aside your preferences, your programs, your I'm comfortable this way, and say, Lord, I want to do the greater things. That's what I want to see is the greater things. Bring revival to this community, to us, to me, to this church. You're looking for someone who says, here I am, Lord. What about you out here and online? Have you done the greater things for Jesus? Who is praising and loving Jesus because of your testimony and your witness and your care? Who has responded to Jesus because of your prayers for that person? Wouldn't it be great at the end of that day, Jesus would say to you, thank you for making my name greater in Hillsborough and in Washington County. Or will he say to you, I'm disappointed that you wanted to make your reputation or the church's reputation greater than my name. What will it be? Who's first in this church? Who's first in your time, in your calendar, in your creed? It is Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other. There's no other salvation for this planet which is so broken. None but you sitting there right now can do the greater things to bring Him glory. There is no limit to what God can do in our church, providing we will not take God's glory to ourselves and do this for us. It's got to be for Him. Now to Him who is able to do a measurably more than we could ask or imagine according to His power that is at work in us to Him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. O church, arise to do the greater things. Let's sing that song.